everyone. My name is Dr. Sharin Tofai. Welcome to Hernia Talk, another Tuesday evening with our favorite people. As many of you know, my name is Sharin Tofai. I am a hernia and laparoscopic surgery specialist. Many of you are joining us live on Facebook at Dr. Tofai. Thank you also for following me on Twitter and Instagram at Hernia Doc. At the end of this episode, I will make sure that you have a link to share and watch it again on my YouTube channel. Today's guest is Dr. Michael Brunt. Dr. Brunt is a laparoscopic surgeon at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. He's actually much more than that. He's, he's an amazing leader and has built an amazing program at Washington University for hernias, as well as for gut surgery. I've known him ever since I've been involved at SAGES, which is our huge laparoscopic um, society. Welcome, Dr. Brunt. Thank you, Dr. Tofai. Uh, I really appreciate you having me uh, for this and uh, talk a little bit about the sports hernia problem. So uh, yeah, it's an honor to be here. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. So um, thank you for your time. You're clearly still at work. Uh, what is that, central time? Are you in central time? Yes. 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 Um, so thank you for that. The uh, a question I'd like to ask, which I never asked you, is you know, you're, you're most well known for your laparoscopic surgery and your foregut surgery. And yet you do have this little bubble of patients that um, you specialize in, which is uh, athletic injuries and sports related hernias. How did you get involved in that? Well, that, I get asked that question uh, quite a bit because it's, uh, it's unusual for a uh, general surgeon by training to get involved in uh, treating athletes. Yeah. Uh, when I, when I first um, started in practice, and I almost don't want to tell you how long ago that was, but uh, it was around 30 years ago at the, and it was at the Jewish Hospital of St. Louis. And now Barnes Hospital and Jewish Hospital are merged. Mm -hmm. But uh, there was one full-time orthopedic surgeon at Jewish, uh, Jerry Gilden, and he was the head uh, team physician for the St. Louis Blues. And, and so, um, and I was uh, one of the few full-time general surgeons there. So um, he started inviting me to a couple of games and uh, I would help cover visiting team a little bit. So, you know, sew up some of the players that got cut. And then um, occasionally there would be a blues player with groin pain. And mm -hmm. so, um, and so I, uh, he would ask me to see them. And uh, initially, I remember the initial player I saw and I examined him, he didn't have a hernia. And I thought, oh, this is not anything related. And then it turned out, I, I read later that summer, he, he went off and saw somebody else actually in Vancouver and they diagnosed him with a sports hernia operated on him. And I thought, I don't know if I believe in this or not. And then uh, a year later or so, um, one of the players had a similar problem and he'd been operated on in Minnesota on the opposite side. And he said, doc, this feels just like the one on the other side. So that was kind of my leap of faith. And, um, and I operated on him. And oh, he did wow. great. And, uh, and so then, you know, once you have one experience, it starts to snowball a little bit. That player actually um, was um, featured in the movie, The Mighty Ducks. If you may remember, there's a visit to the yeah, arena, hockey player, the, uh, Minnesota North Stars, back when the stars were in Minnesota, is wow. featured in that, in that film briefly. So, so that was kind of the beginning. And then I did a few in the, in the 90s here and there, and then started getting asked to speak at some of the uh, uh, team physician meetings, particularly the National Hockey League, because I, I've been, since 1994, I've been the team surgeon for the St. Louis Blues, and it just kind of evolved from there. That's pretty cool, but how did you know what to do? Because we're not taught um, yeah. that anatomy much during general, general surgery residency. Yeah. How did you know what to do? So, uh, I, you know, I, uh, initially, I, I, I didn't, and, uh, and I treated this more or less like a, a regular hernia, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I pretty quickly learned that uh, you, you can't just approach this like it's another hernia. You really have to learn about the constellation of pelvic uh, injuries and pathology that can yeah. occur in a high level athlete. And most of these are muscular strains and, and tendon injuries and things like that that aren't, don't require surgical intervention. So I really had to learn about this. Uh, the field also evolved in the 1990s and early 2000s. And so uh, yeah. it, uh, we, we understand the pathophysiology of this better and why people get these injuries and what you know, anatomy we're trying to re restore. So it's kind of like a hernia repair, but it's, it's modified somewhat. So it's been a gradual evolutionary process. 
This is a great lead into our first question that was submitted, which is, what do you believe are the anatomic abnormalities and pathology that cause the syndrome of sports hernia? Yeah, so, so this Just is to be a- clear, it's not a hernia, correct? It's not a hernia in the sense that there is a, a bulge or a protrusion, okay. but it does involve the same anatomic region to a, an extent. And so uh, there's been the concept uh, that's been um, promoted by Bill Myers, who's done more of these than anybody else in the world, is in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. has a hernia, a sports hernia institute there. Um, and he, he doesn't call it that, but, um, and it, there's this concept of the, of the pelvis pubic joint, okay? And if you think about the, the pelvis bone is where your trunk and your lower body uh, connect. Uh, and, and so the pelvis is kind of this fulcrum around which these powerful forces act. So a, a lot of the thinking is there's an imbalance in the forces and you're strong and powerful in your lower, in your, th in your upper thigh muscles and don't maintain the strength in your trunk. And that creates an imbalance across the, the pubis. Uh, okay. There can actually be tears in where the rectus abdominal muscle attaches around the pubis and connects to the adductor, which is your, what your inner thigh muscle that's involved in a lot of powerful sports movements. Yeah. And that attachment can be torn and that can be the source of the injury. But it's also a little bit like more of a wear and tear injury where things get frayed rather than an acute tear. Uh, and oftentimes um, the athletes present on a gradual basis. It's not a sudden acute injury, but it's more gradual onset. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, but it does affect some of the same anatomic areas that you see uh, with a groin hernia, but with some differences. Yeah, very painful. Uh, I'm a huge Los Angeles Lakers fan. <laughs> Uh, we're out of the playoffs this year, and part of it is we have a lot of injured patient, uh, injured uh, players, a lot of them with groin injuries that are, uh, they heal and they recur again because they come back to play, and it's been a problem. So this is most, from what my understanding is, this is mostly in athletes that have enormous thighs, uh, so disproportionate strength to, of one set of muscles versus the others and or they do very rapid movements that involve like the splits, you know, so like hockey player, soccer player, um, and so on. Is that correct? Or how yeah, do you it, view these? Well, it's, it, it, it tends to occur uh, in elite uh, and professional athletes. Although I, I get referred a lot of recreational athletes, usually high level recreational athletes, I, yes. I will say. Um, and um, it's, a lot of the symptoms occur, they don't occur so much at rest or just with kind of normal activities, but it's with high level accelerating movements, you know, yes. and, and so um, ice hockey, uh, soccer, um, and professional football, those are the three most common sports that we see this in much less common in, um, in baseball and basketball, uh, for yes. example, probably because of the differences in the, in, in the, um, physical movements and um, amongst those uh, sports. And, uh, and yes, oftentimes it involves some degree of tension or tightness in the lower body that, you know, puts more stress across the pubis. And I'd like to accentuate what you said earlier, which is these occur in elite or athletes, a 70 year old male that was, you know, grabbing some groceries and felt a pull should not be having a sports hernia. And, you know, a stay-at-home mom that's picking up her child should not be getting a sports hernia, even though many people kind of refer to this kind of unclear groin pain as a, oh, that's a sports hernia, right? Correct. Um, we do see it sometimes or similar type injuries in some uh, laborers and mm -hmm. that they can have a similar injury with perhaps a sudden work movement or something, or they're really lifting something heavy and they get out of balance and they can pull something. So it can occur in that population, but not generally in individuals who are sedentary and doing relatively low level uh, non-impact activity. Now there's a lot of um, discussion about how these should be approached. If you have a, let's say a partial tear of either the rectus muscle off the bone or the adductor muscle off the, the bone, um, some people say you should just complete that tear. So you have a partial tear completed, then you take the tension off of the area and the pain goes away. Others say, no, you should do the reverse. You should tighten it up 
and um, restore the anatomy. Are both of those correct options? Well, I think uh, uh, what I would say is you have to separate a little bit the abdominal side problem from the uh, groin, the, the, the upper thigh groin and adductor. Mm -hmm. um, the most common groin injury in sports is an adductor or muscle strains. And, yeah. and of the muscle strains, the most common are in the <clears throat> adductor muscle group, which are the inner thigh muscles involved primarily in pulling your leg in. So like you extend your leg and then come in with a kicking motion or a skating motion, that muscle group is most commonly injured. Right. And you can see complete tears with even separation. And the majority of those will heal without requiring any surgical invention intervention. And generally, we try to manage those conservatively initially. Yeah. Uh, the problem you get into is on the abdominal side, when you have an abdominal side tear, uh, those are much uh, less predictable in terms of responding to conservative treatment, although some of them will. Generally, in the elite athlete, professional or collegiate athlete, uh, those will come to early surgical repair. And there's consequences to releasing some of these. You can have Let's say if you're a kicker, you can have leg weakness, or if you're a runner, yeah. leg weakness if you actually release the adductors, correct? Yes. So so on let's let's go back to the abdominal side. We generally yeah. want to repair, strengthen, reinforce, kind of solidify the abdominal side of the mm -hmm. pubis. If they have predominant adductor symptoms and a lot of tension and tightness, then sometimes the only way to kind of get them over that is to do a release. And I typically yeah. will do a partial release of the sheath, not a complete release, yeah. but a little local steroid in. So you want to loosen that adductor side and, and then tighten up and reinforce uh, the abdominal side of the injury. But it's a subset of athletes that require any direct surgical intervention on the adductor. And there's also been discussion about posterior approaches. So do you believe that a posterior approach, let's say a laparoscopic approach, like you do for a regular ingual hernia, putting mesh back there or any other type of uh, buttress back there will in any way take tension off of these and help them there? Uh, yes, there there are, I, I think um, to make, this is confusing even <laughs> to general surgeons and hernia surgeons uh, because um, there are a variety of different approaches that are being used. And there are some pretty strong opinions out there amongst uh, various surgeons that this is this is the best way or this is the only way to right. do it. I think I think the bottom line is is that there are different ways to approach this from a surgical technical perspective that do work in most athletes. Um, and I think the most important thing is that you are making the correct diagnosis and you're doing the right operation for the right athlete. And I think that's the most important thing. When you have, um, I, I preferentially do what's called an open anterior repair. So that means we make an incision about you know, two and a half inches long, uh, yeah. right over the groin, uh, because we'll see pathology in all layers uh, and, uh, and do a broad-based tension-free repair of the floor that incorporates a little bit of the lateral rectus and, and medial support more than I would do for a typical standard inguinal hernia repair mm -hmm. but I've done laparoscopic and, and the laparoscopic is done just for the, the patient audience from the back side of the abdominal muscle or floor and yeah. provides broad base strength and support on the back side and, and that works in in many athletes as well so in selected cases I'll use that also and there are there are groups out there particularly in Europe that preferentially do a laparoscopic uh, approach to repairing these yeah very interesting and um, so you're a general surgeon, general surgery trained. There are orthopedic surgeons that also do this. How does one know who to see? Is it purely based on experience? Or I, I think even orthopedic surgeons aren't, don't get much training on, on this in yeah. their residency either. There, I, uh, as far as I'm aware, there aren't, I don't know of any orthopedic surgeons that are doing abdominal side, inguinal floor, rectus abdominal repairs for this. Yeah. Uh, there are orthopedic surgeons that are doing adductor uh, procedures, but not on the abdominal side. Uh, what's more common is for a general hernia surgeon 
to do this in conjunction with an orthopedic surgeon. Mm -hmm. And uh, and when I first started doing some of the adductor procedures, I had one of our sports orthopedists join me, and um, and it wasn't anything particularly technical, difficult, and and uh, their logistics logistical challenges and pairing up surgeons unless you're working together all the time. So right. uh, I just I do them myself, and I think the most important thing. Um, if you're an elite level athlete is to go to somebody who sees these on a regular basis, uh, because uh, getting the right preoperative initial evaluation and diagnosis and making sure that if conservative treatment is an option that you've had the appropriate type of conservative management early on to try to get you through this, I think that's probably uh, the most important uh, part of this. And this is something that general surgeons and hernia surgeons are becoming much more aware of and, and familiar with. Um, and so, Thanks to you. well, I, I, I think there are a number of people who've tried to help uh, educate us about this, but um, fortunately, unfortunately, some of the insurance carriers are not well educated about it yet. And they still <laughs> have a problem for, for the professional and uh, high level of collegiate athletes. It's not a problem. The schools will cover, but some of the carriers uh, consider this, quote unquote experimental and, and, and don't want to cover it unless you list it as just a hernia surgery, which it's not yes. exactly. So there's multiple different um, modalities to do conservative therapy. One is just rest and stop playing your sport. Um, the other is different types of injections. What is your protocol for that? Or do you have a team that helps you with that? Well, the, I mean, the initial uh, approach is, is to rest and to get some local directed therapy. And that includes ice, it may include anti-inflammatories. Uh, <clears throat> there are some more sophisticated soft tissue therapies that can be used. Uh, there's some, uh, some groups that will use a lot of dry needling. We try to avoid using PRP injections around this area. Um, I will occasionally do a local plus steroid injection mm -hmm. um, in part, sometimes to temporize and perhaps to get an athlete through the late phase of a, of a of regular season or through a playoff or something. Um, and then, um, um, and sometimes we'll use it just for diagnostic purposes right. to inject a trigger point to see, does that eliminate the pain? And that may give you um, more confidence in going in and, and then doing a repair in that individual. Tell me more about PRP and why you don't believe it should be done. Well, in, in Los Angeles, it's given out like water. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and I, I think that's a little bit of the uh, issue with it. I mean, it's 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 expensive. Um, there's not really a lot of good evidence or data around the benefit out of certain areas within orthopedics. And I, I will confess, I, I don't know that literature extensively. Mm -hmm. um, one of the issues that has come up around its use in the adductor groin, and uh, Dr. Myers has uh, talked about this, is that they can athletes can get uh, what's called heterotopic calcification, so they can get significant calcium deposits along the tendon, and that can be a problem. And so, uh, in the adductor groin, we tend to um, to uh, counsel against uh, getting PRP there. I think Dr. Tofai is frozen. Hello, Sharon. I don't hear any audio from you. Uh-oh. You're back. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> My computer decided to want to just let web uh, on the uh, thing all of a sudden. Computers uh, that. do that. But I Zoom. did hear you. <laughs> I did hear you. So yes, that's exactly correct. Is that um, the heter heterotopic calcification can be an issue and interfere yeah. with, I think it, it can interfere with their uh, rehabilitation in many ways. I've seen some yeah. pretty bad calcifications in some patients. Yeah. 
uh, we have another question about nerve entrapment. Um, let me share a screen with you. So some of the issues is what if you have a tear and you're entrapping the nerve or you have scar tissue and you're entrapping the nerve do you believe nerve compression or entrapment or traction injury is contributing to some of these sport hernia symptoms? And if so, how do you address it preoperatively? Um, this is a really good question. And, and the answer is yes, I think it can be a factor and contributing in some cases, but it is not the predominant mechanism in, yeah. most, in most athletes. And, um, and so, um, uh, some of the symptoms that maybe are a little bit of a tip off if there's more of a burning type sensation that an athlete gets this can also be a situation in which a local uh, uh, block or injection can help you preoperatively and we always look at uh, the nerves when we go in and do this open which is an advantage of doing it in an open fashion and uh, sometimes we'll find a, a nerve branch of the ilial inguinal nerve which is a superficial sensory nerve that runs through the groin canal, uh, passes through a slit in the external oblique, which is like the roof of the of the inguinal canal, and uh, and it can be pinched or trapped, and 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 sometimes we'll just release that so that it's not uh, going through a slit anymore. And yeah. on occasion, but in a relatively small percentage, sometimes I'll just go ahead and resect the nerve, which can leave you with some numbness, uh, but doesn't cause really any other long term consequences. So uh, so I think this is a factor. Uh, in some athletes, but it's a relatively small percentage, probably 10% or less. Um, we have some fans of yours on this, on this webinar. So here's a question. Dr. Brunt, in your excellent book on sports hernia and athletic pubalgia, you included several different surgical approaches. Can you comment on the all suture repair described by Drs. Litwin and Busconi, and in particular, the safety of reattaching the rectus abdominis to the periosteum with a broad capture of the highly innervated periosteum. Well, now, if you think that my patient uh, population, uh, my, my audience is not educated, uh, that is a question that is uh, pretty fancy. Well, first of all, I'd say I'm <laughs> impressed, not yeah. only that you, you saw the book, but that you, you asked a specific question like that. So yes. uh, kudos to that uh, individual. Um, it, it, it's a really good question. This is one of the controversies. So uh, just so you're aware, uh, uh, Dr. Litwin uh, uh, is at University of uh, Massachusetts in Worcester, and that's where Dr. Myers was chair of surgery for several years. So Dr. Litwin learned a little bit of that technique. It's essentially uh, the same uh, uh, or similar primary sutured technique that Dr. Myers uses, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a couple of uh, layers of, of sutures where the healthier tissue is kind of sewn over to back over towards the pubis and to the inguinal ligament. Um, the issue, um, and I think, it, and it works really well in those hands. Um, the issue um, in my experience for the primary sutured repair is avoiding excessive tension on the floor. And 25 years right. ago, essentially inguinal hernia repairs um, migrated away from primary sutured repair for that very reason. And so uh, with, a, with a, a mesh repair, you basically can create a tension-free approach. And that's what has worked well in my hands. Mm -hmm. um, it's really, there's, there's, there's not often an actual uh, uh, riff, rift or rent of the uh, abdominal rectus insertion off the pubis that you can feel and reattach down to the pubis. And so basically what we're doing is broadening out that whole uh, area of support and attachment across the, the pubis and the, and the uh, posterior inguinal floor when we do this um, in, in a, in a tension-free mesh type uh, uh, fashion. I know that the results are good in Dr. Litwin's hands and of course in Dr. Myers's hands. Dr. Bisconi actually was, a, uh, we, the Blues used to have a, uh, their uh, American Hockey League team was in Worcester. And so I uh, got to know him through that. And he does the adductor portion. Dr. Litwin does the abdominal side. Uh, very good. Yeah, we had one surgeon from the Vincera Institute and we hope to get Dr. Myers um, in the future too for, for these, these, um, these sessions. So educational. 
Um, when you do the mesh repairs, do you use a particular mesh or do you think synthetic mesh is appropriate all the time? Or do you, there's some hybrid meshes out there, or biologic mesh, what do you think? Yeah, I use, I use a lightweight, and I think it's this key, yeah. lightweight polypropylene based mesh that has mm -hmm. a, an absorbable component, uh, but it is a permanent synthetic mesh. Um, it's really well incorporated into the tissues. There's some modifications I do uh, covering the mesh with part of the internal oblique that minimizes the contact of the mesh with the spermatic cord in males yes. uh, and also helps protect it from the nerves. And so that's a modification I use particularly in the majority of athletes. Um, and, yeah. but it's a lightweight uh, mesh with a, uh, a little bit of an absorbable component. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Interseed. Interseed's uh, basically mm -hmm. uh, like Seprofilm. It's a mm -hmm. anti-adherent barrier, but unlike Seprofilm, it's not really difficult to handle. It is very fabric-y. Um, it's sold mostly for gynecologic operations, but uh, so it's like marketed towards the gynecologist. But mm -hmm. yeah, I, I wrap the spermatic cord with that, especially in mm -hmm. revisional procedures where they already have testicular pain. I feel that it really helps reduce the risk of the uh, interaction of the mesh with the right. with the spermatic cord, which can right. can cause symptoms. Or, in or situations when you're having to go in for chronic groin pain and, and excise mesh. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense to use something Absolutely. like that. I just sure. did that yeah. today, just uh, yeah. as I ran here <laughs> right after finishing yeah. surgery with revisional and um, I used the, the nerve was involved too. So I put some of the anti-adherent um, interest seat over the nerve and also the spermatic cord for that patient. Yeah. Um, the other question uh, has to do with uh, you know, direct hernias versus indirect hernias and how much of that can be related to sports injuries. So do you believe that attenuation of the inguinal floor or kind of like a laxity and a tear of the muscle or tendon at the pubic plate contribute are, are basically equal in terms of how well, they present or how do you differentiate if someone has like a hernia recurrence or a direct hernia versus like a true sports hernia? Is it based on history, well, exam, imaging? Well, um, I, I think let's just, let, let's start just focusing on the athletic groin pain yeah. uh, situation. So um, not every athlete who has an abdominal inguinal floor side problem has an imageable tear of the rectus abdominal aponeurosis attachment right. around the pubis. Yeah. Uh, the most consistent finding in my operative experience, and we just looked at this and have around 400 uh, cases uh, now that we've looked at and look specifically at the operative findings, but this attenuation in the posterior inguinal floor without a true direct hernia bulge is, mm -hmm. is the most consistent finding that we see there. Okay. And so I, I, I don't, in my view, there's no question that that is uh, contributing to this. Uh, um, certainly the rectus abdominal attachment and, and what that does when you lose that support is that puts more tension on the rectus attachment and maybe it's contributing to the tear mm -hmm. that you see in some athletes or not. So I think it's hard to kind of give that complete weight, but it, I think it's definitely a factor. But there's not typically a direct hernia bulge uh, when you examine these athletes, you often can appreciate relative weakness in their floor compared to some, someone who's uh, age matched and, uh, um, and, and doesn't even have a true hernia. They usually have a little more substance there. And I, it, we think it's probably in part just because of the long-term repetitive nature of the movements. And yeah, absolutely. There. Plus there's so much scar tissue from the history of multiple episodes of strains and inflammation and mm -hmm. micro tears and, and <clears throat> healing and fibrosis and scarring from it. Um, how much of just the scar tissue do you think can, can contribute to groin pain? Well, I think I, I don't see as much of that on the inguinal side. I think mm -hmm. um, it certainly can on the adductor side as you, um, as you heal and develop fibrosis. And in some athletes have had a significant adductor injury, they may even have some you know, calcification along the tendon. And I think definitely that probably is a contributory factor to some of the pain. I think 
you or maybe intermittently froze there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I did. <laughs> um, what I feel that, so I, I recently did a, a lady, she was a former, a very professional fighter and just chronic pain, no one could figure it out. I finally explored her. She had so much scar tissue um, in the retroperitoneal space and also in the, in the retro where she felt it but it's just amazing when i operate on nfl, NFL flares just i just see so much scar uh, i feel from years of injuries and overuse maybe in the area you know i think one of the other uh, variables maybe uh, i sometimes get asked you know why are you seeing so many of these uh, athletes today and um and i think mm -hmm. it's it's partly uh, increased recognition and awareness. Uh, it's probably it's partly more sophisticated imaging that can sort some of these things out. But yeah. I, I think it's also that we see so many athletes today uh, at the high level. Um, they've played one or mostly one sport for most of their lives. And right. uh, whereas 30 years ago, you know, kids were playing multiple sports and they right. would vary in the seasons. And now if you're hockey player you play hockey year round from when you're seven or eight years old yeah and so repetitive movements and just the analogy is a little bit to you can see what's happening in major league baseball with all of the um, um the ulnar collateral ligament injuries the so-called tommy john you know, injuries yeah. that have occurred in in pitchers and of course they're you know they're throwing harder but they've also been throwing you know most of their lives and so I think there's probably that's probably a factor as well in some of this we're seeing. Yeah, you have two questions uh, submitted for you about your hernia repair or sports hernia repair. So you alluded to how you kind of change your technique just slightly for the uh, these sports hernias. Can you explain in more detail how your repair for these sports hernias in the open fashion differs from the standard Lichtenstein hernia repair? Yeah, well, I, there are a lot of similarities, uh, but and I think uh, one important <clears throat> aspect is it sh this should be a flat uh, mesh configuration. Yes. Uh, so no plugs, two, no PHS. No, meshes. no, I, I'm, I'm, I do <laughs> not you. like mesh plugs. Uh, Good for you. <laughs> I certainly would not want a mesh plug in my groin. Yes. Uh, I've taken uh, quite a few of them out, um, but um, you want a flat configuration. Number two, uh, the pathology is not at the internal ring. Mm -hmm. So you're not trying to fix a problem where the spermatic cord comes out through the, from inside the abdomen out through the internal ring into the groin canal. So th that, that's not an issue. We always examine it, but you just don't find a hernia sac there. Mm -hmm. So you really don't need much support up above that. And then uh, I, I, I make it. sure that I extend my support medially and, and I put a couple of uh, two or three medial stitches down and make sure that I've, in some cases, I might do a plication stitch or two right at the pubis, but usually I, I accomplish that by you know, making sure that, that I've got the mesh support there on the medial side. Right. And then the last thing I do is I, I'll try to create a little pocket under the internal oblique because uh, we're anchoring the mesh underneath that. And I'll bring that over and sew it to the, um, the lateral edge. And I don't know if this is too technical for the audience, but over by the inguinal ligament. So that, that native tissue is creating a, a true biologic barrier between the mesh and the cord. Mm -hmm. And then um, the other finding that we didn't really hit on very much that's pretty consistent is uh, these athletes have a very attenuated external oblique, which is the roof. And, uh, and oftentimes yeah. their external ring is almost like not even there. Yeah. And, it, and, and it's like translucent, you can see through it. And normally it should be kind of white shiny tissue, even in individuals who have true hernias. So uh, I, we make sure that we, close that up appropriately. And I use an absorbable stitch for that, but we bring that back together as well and make sure the nerves are protected or if they're uh, entrapped in any way, either release them or, or remove the nerve. I don't ever do anything about the genital nerve. Um, uh, it's only been the ileal inguinal. Yeah. Okay. And the second one is about laparoscopic. So does open, how does opener endoscopic placement of mesh address the mechanism? So do, you did, you did agree earlier that um, it does take tension off anteriorly when you put a posterior barrier? Yeah, well, I think it, 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 uh, it provides you with broad-based support across yeah. the uh, 
the posterior rectus and 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 uh, inguinal floor from the backside. Yeah. And I, I think if you've got an, a demonstrable rectus aponeurosis injury and mm. and uh, um, then a laparoscopic approach works for a lot of athletes. In my experience, it's probably only about 10 or 11%. And the majority of those have been in athletes who had prior open inguinal surgery. So I'm, I'm in part doing it to avoid having to go through the scar tissue in the, in the um, anterior groin and the front yes, of the groin. That's very true. So, and nerves look like scar tissue. So it's hard. You don't want to injure those by accident. Yeah. Um, what sutures do you use for, for these repairs? Oh, now you're getting really technical. I mean, it's a question. I'm not making these up. <laughs> I, okay, I use a suture called O Neuralon, um, okay. um, which is a braided nylon suture. It's a permanent suture, and it's on a, 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 a needle called a CT2 needle, which is a great hernia needle. Uh, yes, it's really good. Needle. And I and I, I I suture in medially along the the transversalis aponeurosis and rectus with that, and then I run a proline stitch, which is a monofilament suture up the lateral side. And then when I do the further anchoring medially, I use an absorbable suture for that. Right. And why do you choose the Neuralon? Because I, I like we must the have way, Neuralon, but I, I don't really use it. Much. I like the way it handles. I like the way it ties. I, yeah. uh, it is a permanent suture. I like that aspect of it. Yeah. Um, and I, I really like that particular needle that it comes on. I, I, I trained, when I trained, uh, uh, I think maybe I did one mesh hernia repair as a resident. It was all yeah. primary suture repair. And we, so you got used to using kind of certain hernia needles. It's a little shorter needle and it's good at, at at suturing in that kind of thicker aponeurosis tissue. Yeah, it's still great. I still use the CT2 needle on the yeah. tool pony. All right, see, um, great, mind, great, great, great minds uh, think alike. <laughs> it's a great needle. What suture I, do you I use? Call, I use tool proline for okay. all of it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that um, you know I, I've never I've never been exposed to Neuralon. I think maybe it just depends on the hospitals I've been. Um, trained at and i'm sure they have it i'm going to try and yeah look, look i've not had any problems with it i i partly do it because um well a little history of why i started doing it this way uh, i the, the lichtenstein group originally i think they described open interrupted i mean interrupted suture for the medial yes. slide yes and so i started doing it that way and you, and you get used to it and i i think it just allows me to <clears throat> place those um uh, more precisely on that medial side. And I use the proline laterally because it's just easy to run it up the angle of ligament. Yeah. And, um, you know, <clears throat> I see a lot of patients with mesh and or suture reactions, like actual allergic reactions or inflammatory reactions to their mesh and sometimes to their sutures. And we've been looking at allergy testing to see if we can predict um, who, what suture they won't react to. And nylon tends to be one that no one really reacts to. So I wonder if the braided nylon is um, a good option. Just, so. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I'm, I have not had any problems with it. Yeah. Um, so um, I have uh, had issues on umbilical hernia repair sometimes with ethabon suture, which is also a braided non-absorbable suture and occasionally getting having that suture spit or have a little suture abscess, but I've not had that issue with Neuralon. Yeah. I'm it sorry, Sharon. It's about the importance of picking the right needle. Yeah. <clears throat> I also talked to the residents about picking the right needle, you know, to, uh, to, to match kind of the tissue you're dealing with, the, the, um, the angle at which you're trying to get to. Yeah, it all works out really well. Um, what do you do in patients that have already had a hernia repair and now they may have a sports injury? Does that, does that happen? Well, yeah, it does happen. It, it's not as uh, common. Um, I know Bill Myers <clears throat> um, has operated on a lot of people who've had prior hernia repairs, in particular laparoscopic hernia repairs. Mm -hmm. I have not seen as many failures uh, after mm -hmm. that. Uh, but um, if they've had a prior open anterior um, groin repair, and I have something, uh, an imaging finding, you know, rectus tear or whatever, um, then in that in a, uh, situation, I would lean a bit more towards doing a laparoscopic repair because maybe all they need is just some of that support. additional broad-based uh, posterior support, particularly if yeah. they've had a primary sutured repair before. And that avoids staying out of that scar tissue and um, 
potentially risking, you know, injury to the blood supply of the testicle yeah. or whatever. Now I, I keep talking about, you know, the spermatic cord and blood supply of the testicle. I, I do want to say that these injuries do occur in women also, yes, uh, but they are much, much more common in men, probably for a number of reasons. Um, and, um, but they do occasionally occur in women as well. Yeah, that's very true. And you know what I do, uh, a lot of my practice is in women. So even though technically I should be seeing on a seven or 10 to one ratio of males to females, I'm a little bit above 50% women, about 51% of my practice is in women. And part of it is that, um, like you kind of alluded to, women don't necessarily always get talked about when, when we have pretty discussions and there's very little data and testing in women, um, like in clinical trials or anything like that. And then also it's because I've noticed is women have groin pain and they're sent to the gynecologist, you know, is it endometriosis, maybe it's an ovarian cyst rupture, maybe it's your fibroids, but they have occult inguinal hernias, small hernias with a little piece of fat in it that's causing their symptoms. And some people label that as sports hernia because they feel any groin pain that is without a big palpable hernia, um, it's a sports hernia and it's just such a misnomer. And we have surgeons around me too that uh, label themselves or market themselves as like sports hernia surgeons. They're really just fixing hernias mm -hmm. that are small. <laughs> um, no, I don't know if you have any comment about that or do you see that often? Well, I don't, I don't think, let's separate the indirect and direct. So indirect yeah. hernias, uh, I don't think are really a part of this uh, problem. Uh, yeah. in the athletes. I mean, occasionally there will be uh, an athlete that also has a true uh, standard inguinal hernia. Okay. And you can fix those any way, any way you want, whatever you think is the best approach for them. I, that's different from the sport hernia. And I, and I also uh, should just say that uh, the terminology around sports hernia is a little bit confusing. Yeah. Um, it because it's it's a little bit of a misnomer not being a true hernia with a protrusion, yeah. uh, even though it affects some of the uh, similar anatomy, um, and and so the term athletic pubalgia mm -hmm. uh, came into vogue, um, and that actually I think is a very uh, appropriate uh, description because it refers to athletic groin pain around the pubis, and it's not just specific to the inguinal canal. It can be pubic related pathology where it's a stress fracture or osteitis pubis. It can include adductor hip flexor muscle group. All those are in that athletic pubalgia umbrella. The problem yeah. with the athletic pubalgia terminology is it's hard for lay people to say that. And it's hard for the sports yeah. commentators to say had surgery for athletic pubalgia injury. Mm -hmm. So that's partly why sports injury. And that's partly why Bill Myers pushed this core muscle injury concept. And, yeah. and the challenge with the core muscle injury, uh, yes, these, this is core muscle, but the core muscle can go from your, from your rib cage all the way down to your mid thigh. And so it's not anatomically very specific. So I, I think sports hernia is going to stay in the lexicon in all likelihood, but, but you'll read now more in, uh, in the, on the sports pages about so-and-so had a core muscle surgery. Yeah, from a marketing standpoint, it's definitely the easiest term to use and most um, kind of uh, intuitive way of kind of thinking about it, even though technically it's it's not a hernia. Um, I have a question because I've been asked this question. I've, I've never had a good answer for it. <laughs> so the typical Lichtenstein hernia repair involves suturing a medial, medial suture. And the suture, back when I was a resident, they said, put it through the periosteum. Then there was discussion of, well, that's going to cause chronic pain, maybe osteitis pubis, which is inflammation and pain from the, the, the bone. And so, no, you should not do that. You should put your suture through the rectus muscle and rectus insertion on the, on the bone, so not through the bone. Um, and that's what I do. And yet part of these sports hernia procedures is actually suturing through bone and orthopedic surgeons, surgeons suture through bone and periosteum all the time. So is it an in, inaccurate statement to say that suturing mesh to the pubic bone is, can cause chronic pain or is mesh the issue and not the suturing 
to the bone. What are your thoughts on that? Well, so uh, there's, I, I don't try to suture to the periosteum of the bone. I don't think okay. you want, I don't think that's a good practice. I, I think I worry, uh, I would be concerned that there is a risk of, of getting some degree of chronic pain from that uh, and reaction around the periosteum of the bone, which is a very tight kind of dense layer right around the bone. But you do have very good quality ligamentous tissue where the, the ligaments come in and, um, and attach around the pubis. And that's where I try to anchor my stitches in is that good ligamentous tissue, but with not putting the stitch down into grazing the bone, if you will, or the periosteum mm -hmm. of the bone. So I think you've, you, you, you can almost always find good quality tissue there to use without having to put a stitch in the periosteum. Um, uh, they're actually, if I can just uh, digress a bit, um, some of these adductor tears where the adductor is completely torn off the pubis and even retracted, uh, there have been some efforts uh, to reattach those and that right. would require uh, bone anchors and reattaching it into the bone and there's actually been a study of nfl players and it was an it was a not a controlled case study but they looked at at, at athletes who had comparable degrees of separation and had uh, sutured repair with bone anchors versus conservative management and the conservative group got back to full athletic activity a few weeks sooner than the ones that had surgical repair so I just I think you want to be careful about suturing anything uh, into the bone around the groin region yeah that's fantastic thank you so much um, you're aware of Dr. Mishawak in Germany and uh, others who I, everyone kind of has their own way of doing things they're often quite similar. They're just being touted as being more particular to one surgeon versus another. But part of the groin tissue repairs uh, theories is instead of putting an only mesh in, you should actually plicate uh, um, the defect, more of a tissue repair and or do both. Um, what are your thoughts on those? Well, so I actually visited uh, Dr. Muschewick in, um, in Munich, uh, Germany. Uh, she's an yeah. e excellent surgeon, and um, and um, um, and she does this uh, this minimal repair, and and I think what she's really contributed yeah. is getting um, athletes back to sport uh, quicker, and and so what she does is um, it's it's analogous somewhat to a shoulder ice hernia repair, um, and uh, um, basically uh, uh, opens up just the area of the of the bulging of the posterior floor and then does one suture running up and back down and then another one from the uh, down and back up and so kind of uh, the plication I think is a is a good way to describe it or or imbricating and um, those muscle layers over so it is a primary uh, sutured repair yeah. uh, I don't want to come in about results and that sort of thing, um, because I haven't seen any of her results published uh, lately. But that's the basic technique. And getting back to what I said earlier, um, I, in my hands, um, it's difficult to get that uh, kind of repair and to have a durable uh, repair without tension. And so yes. that's why I use the approach I use. Because it also does not, it's a, it's a true plication. There's no opening of the floor to release that tension, like a shoulder ice, right? Well, it opens, uh, it's just the part that's kind of really attenuated and bulging. It's not opened all the way down like you would yeah. for a standard shoulder ice hernia repair. Yeah, correct. Yeah. This is all fascinating. Um, so I, do you teach your residents um, tissue repairs? I, I am, but I just feel that I, I'm, there's very little of that done. I'm probably about the only person here that may occasionally do a yeah. primary tissue repair, yeah. but I don't do it very often. And uh, the population that I will do it in uh, typically um, would be uh, a woman uh, yes. with yeah. an indirect hernia. Um, not, not so much with a direct hernia, but a woman with an indirect hernia, if there's not yeah. a lot of tension, I'll do a primary sutured repair. And the other uh, situation in which I will use it is sometimes I'll have a, a really young athlete who may be late teens and still growing. And, uh, in that situation, I would, uh, I would try to do a primary sutured repair, but our trainees get very little experience with primary uh, suture repair for, uh, groin hernias. 
Yeah, I'm predicting that's going to, the pendulum is going to start swinging the other way. Um, I certainly do a fair amount of tissue repairs. One is, of course, I see a lot of women. And um, I also have a lot of people that have, you know, problems with their mesh. And then if it needs to be removed, they don't want the mesh anymore. So the, the tissue repair is always an option. But um, yeah, they enjoy it. It's a great operation. The Shoulder Ice, Bassini, McVay, all of those. Um, you do, uh, uh, we'll need to talk more offline about this, but do yeah. you, do, you do more Bassini uh, repairs generally when you do primary sutured repair? Or? I prefer the shoulder ice and shoulder the ice, okay. for any femoral hernias. And we've had yeah. a couple of patients that surprisingly had femoral hernias and we changed our, our tissue plans to, to do a McVeigh. And it's part of their boards, you know, they have to be able to understand the anatomy and, and know how to do a tissue repair in cases where mesh is not indicated. So um, they get all excited <laughs> when they're, they're learning yeah. that. And I think it's really yeah. good, good anatomy too. I may be done one McVeigh repair in the last 10 years. No kidding. Yeah, probably very I, uncommon. I did two but... this year already. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> well, when but, we you know, were... different patient population. Yeah, yeah, well, I did them in a number of males when I first started in practice and for more, more for direct hernias. And yes. I just, well, over the long haul, a higher failure rate. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's, that's absolutely right. Um, and tell me a little bit about your practice. Patients uh, come and see you. Is there a, do they, they call a central office? How do patients reach you if they, they're out of town, out of country? Well, are you referring to the athletic population? Both, yeah. I yeah, know. well, so I, I mean, the athlete's a little bit of a different situation. I get, I get uh, referrals um, from a variety of sources in the athletic population. Um, um, I get a lot of athletes regionally uh, just because, you know, most of the sports people and therapists know that I do this and a lot of the general surgeons as well. So anytime they see somebody who has groin pain and doesn't have a hernia maybe it's a sports hernia go see brunt yeah. so uh and you know those come through the office we we like to screen records in advance um and if they've had outside imaging it's become important for us to get the images and get yes. them looked at first before they actually see me otherwise uh you know they may, we may find out it's a poor quality mri and we're gonna yeah. have to repeat it and i have people driving here some sometimes from five six seven hours away and others flying in so we like to know if we're going to need to repeat imaging in advance and we haven't talked about it but my go-to imaging test for athletes with groin pain is a pelvic mri and they're very yeah. specific sequences that we do it gives you the most detail ct scan is pretty non-informative we rarely do that um, there are some groups that do ultrasound dynamic ultrasound imaging we haven't done that so much uh, i still think you need the mri to, yeah. to look at the pubis and and the adductor muscle groups and that sort of thing and, um, and, and, and so um, in terms of, you know, I, I'm on, um, you know, NHL, I'm one of the NHL team, uh, physicians, so, um, and second opinion list for the NHL and, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and NFL as well. So we'll, we'll get calls directly from trainers and, and team physicians uh, and, uh, and from some of the colleges uh, uh, around as well. So it, it's it's varied how you get uh, your referral uh, network, yeah. Uh, but uh, so some of them are direct, you know, to me from people who know me, and others are, um, you know, through the office. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, I, I I think, uh, uh, Doctor to Tofa, the, the other thing that we haven't really talked about um, is that um, this um, taking care of athletes. It, it's not just about the individual surgeon. Uh, it, it's really about having a program to manage these and a systematic mm -hmm. approach. And, uh, and um, it includes, um, you know, your orthopedic colleagues oftentimes because there can be other lap with over other injuries like hip problems. Um, yeah. And I've had athletes, you know, referred to me with, and particularly middle-aged uh, for a, a sports hernia. And it turns out they've got, they've got bad arthritis in their hip. It's a hip problem. So you have to, know how to do those exams and you have to work with your orthopedic colleagues 
Um, but also the musculoskeletal radiologists are invaluable for me. And we've both educated yes. each other about this so problem. Much. And it's all of our MRIs get sent to them. They do an official read and a consult. Um, and, and sometimes we'll, we'll talk about uh, the cases. And then um, the rehab is critically important after the surgery. Uh, it's, it's important to have a structured rehab program. The one that I use was put together with the help of Ray Barilli, who's the head athletic trainer with the athletic, uh, St. Louis Blues. We've worked together for 27 years now. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to have that structured uh, rehab program uh, uh, for managing the athlete after surgery uh, in order to get them back to full speed. Because it's not just, it's not all about uh, the surgery and correcting a problem. It's also making sure that uh, they restore their functional balance across their whole core and their lower body as well. Yeah, it's so important. I feel that the the core balance and the kind of balance of, of building the different muscle groups are so important um, to prevent these, number one, and also as part of the rehabilitation. Do you have that, any of that published where others can look at the either the MRI protocol that you use or the sports um, kind of rehabilitation? I, I don't, uh, neither one of those. Well, actually the, the rehab protocol or a version of it is published uh, primarily in <clears throat> one or more book chapters that mm -hmm. we've written. Right, yeah. So, um, you know, I could probably send you that link at some point if you want with a reference if need be. Yeah, I'd but love that's, to. Yeah, that yeah, would be published there, up. yeah. That would be great. Yeah, for MRIs, we use a, um, it's a non-contrast pelvic MRI. We call it a hernia protocol. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of places they call it a sports protocol, but it involves not only complete MRI, but also it's dynamic images where they push in and out. Some subtle findings of hernia recurrences are um, found on those that, that you can't necessarily find if you're just laying flat on the MRI. So. It's, I love MRIs, I think it's great, but most surgeons are not comfortable with MRIs and CT scans where our comfort zone tends to be. And it's hard to find a good ultrasonographer that can reliably give you information. So it's um, one of those things where, um, uh, yeah, CT scan is often the first study in the United States at least that's ordered and not helpful at all. Yeah. <laughs> No, I just yeah. recently had one uh, athlete CT scan completely normal, get the MRI, and there's all kinds of pathologies, a rectus adductor, ponderosus tear, and yes. parasympathetic edema, none of which showed up on the CT scan. So yes. you really need the MRI. I, the, the ultrasound, I, I think, in, 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 in experienced hands can be very good, yes. um, but it's very operator dependent. And the pr part of the problem with it is if somebody else does it, all you can, you have to rely on the report. You can't actually interpret the images very well, unless you're doing it yourself. It's, it's not like looking at an ultrasound of the gallbladder yeah. where you can see there's stones, you know, and there's a thick wall or there's not, but you, you really- Very you complicated. Know, depend on that dynamic imaging and on-site interpretation. Yeah, very complicated, that's so true. Yeah, which is why this kind of team approach really helps. You know, I have, I have uh, radiologists that are very happy to, to read imaging that they didn't do and, um, they understand like my patient population and it's it's hard when you're seeing a doctor and you don't know what to ask and um there the resource may not be there so a lot of what we share during this webinar is you know there are people like you around with telehealth it's much easier since the pandemic to reach out to specialists that are not uh, physically near you to at least get some guidance as to which direction to go. Do you even have a sports hernia? And if so, what images or interventions need to be done to help figure it out instead of having to travel all over the, the nation to try and figure yeah. that out? Well, I think part the good news is I think uh, hernia surgeons are, are becoming more knowledgeable about this area yeah. and, and more comfortable in, in seeing and managing uh, some of these athletes. And so I think you, you, you'll find surgeons in all regions of the country that have, uh, have learned about this and are willing to see some of these uh, patients and athletes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time. I learned a lot and everyone's very thankful for you and I appreciate the time to well, 
do this with you. And Thank I'm you. so glad to see you. It's been so yeah. long. Since I've yeah, actually, it's it's, it's great. Great. To see you. Great to see you too. And thank you so much for the invitation. This has been a great conversation. A lot of really good yeah. questions uh, from your audience. So yeah. Yeah. I love that. my audience. Yeah. They're, and, they're great. Uh, they, they do a lot of their own research. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. All right, everyone. Bye. On that note, thanks for joining us on Hernia Talk Live. We'll see you again next week with another amazing guest. Thanks for everyone who follows me on herniatalk.com um, on our website, which is a free discussion forum for all of you. Uh, I will make sure that you get the link to watch and share from YouTube, and it'll be uh, shared on all my social media avenues. And again, thanks so much to Dr. Um, Front for his time and sharing all of his knowledge. And I hope to see you soon. I'll see you at Sages, hopefully. Um, maybe we can catch up there. And thanks everyone else for watching. Bye, everyone. Thanks. All right. Take care. Good night. Thanks. Bye.